Dear Jael Lehmann, thank you very much for inviting me to this really exciting um, conference and uh, or labor, one really should say, in um, uh, going back to what Black Mountain College initiated. Um, I'm really happy that uh, I'm, I can uh, uh, be here and talk and uh, contribute a bit, I hope so. Um, I, it was a, a great initiative um, to collaborate with uh, the Hamburger Bahnhof and uh, to have this kind of a long-term um, idea on working together uh, in the arts, uh, education and as well science. So uh, what I will try is just to, um, to uh, yeah, I think you, you said already a lot about what Black Mountain College was, so I will uh, um, go for the question of moving and spatial uh, correlations and um, uh, yeah we will see it's just a, a kind of really to constellate something because to get deeply into a kind of close reading is not the place here I think so it's too short a time. At Black Mountain College John Cage, Merz Cunningham and Buckminster Fuller and those three will be my heroes for the short introduction today among other artists shared investment among, um, among the American avant-garde. Exploring borders between still and movement, silence and sound, these artists developed new models of time and spatial arrangement. In their search of new dynamics of creativity in art, science, and education, how can we read and reread the impact of these new ideas of production and performance today? How in this impact of these practices in contemporary dance and performance, how is the impact? Since there are numerous exhibitions around this creative hotspot, Black Mountain College, within the last uh, years, let's try to trace a few constellations. And I think the constellation is a very, uh, from Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, is a very productive term in what there was going on uh, in um, these uh, uh, modes of um, uh, collaboration um, between dance, performance, music, and architecture. When I saw recently in New York at the MoMA the exhibition on John Cage and his famous silent piece 433, um, the uh, uh, um, exhibition was entitled There Will Never Be Silence, I was again fascinated by the various inspirations and collaborations at the time um, between artists like Cage, Cunningham, Robert Rauschenberg, Josef and Annie Albers, Kaprov and Dick Higgins and others who met at Black Mountain College. Founded in 1933 as a new kind of college, and this of course will be mentioned many, many times this day today, uh, where the study of art played a major role in education, the Black Mountain College attracted these artists and scholars who were interested especially in the experimental and interdisciplinary approach in science and as well in art. One may remember relations to similar educational experiments in education in Europe, and this is from where I want to start. For instance, at Hellerau, near Dresden, between 1906 and 1925, or at the Monte Verita, where Rudolf von Laban, with dancers and artists, created a new concept of body, space, movement and education, or, of course, the Bauhaus, which was mentioned already, and where the transfer of concepts from Bauhaus to Black Mountain was a part of what Josef and Annie Albers, um, Walter Gropius and others, Xanti Shawinsky, all those were mentioned, brought to Black Mountain in a question of educational transmission of arts, crafts, movements, media and technology. So even, um, this is why I show these pictures, the um, building of the Black Mountain College um, was kind of, there is a similarity uh, uh, within the architecture and with the kind of how it is located, um, not in a, um, a near a big city, but just uh, in the landscape. So it's kind of part of a, a landscapal and an, an architectural project as well. The idea that creation 
Creative arts and practical responsibilities are equally important to the development of the intellect was a guiding principle at the Black Mountain College coming from John Dewey as, uh, and his uh, famous pedagogical concepts. The idea of what even today in arts, uh, especially in the dance, um, uh, is a new part of a concept, the sharing not only the living together, but sharing as an experiment in participation and democracy. With this emphasis on processes of teaching, people were more interested in what they did not know than in what they did know. And this was part of this uh, question um, Yai Lehmann already mentioned this morning. One of the teachers who incorporated this unorthodox way of teaching was, of course, Richard Buckminster Fuller, mentioned already, who was there in two summers in 1948 and 49, where he was teaching and where he met Joseph and Annie Albers, John Cage and Merce Cunningham and other artists. His teaching system was, was quite unacademic and he was a pioneer, one could claim, in project-based teaching. So he often merged students' uh, uh, exercises and, uh, and, and works with his own research. So things we would like to do and share with our students, but it's kind of what he did was um, uh, that he, in a, a way of lecture performances, very charismatic and enthusiastic, uh, uh, inspired his students, an inspiring teacher. At that time, he worked at the design of the geodesic dome, and he encouraged his students to build a self-supporting spherical structure. This failed so dismally at the in that first time, time and uh, uh, Jael Lehmann mentioned it already, that he was nicknamed the Supine Dome. <laughs> but when he returned um, the following summer, his course was a triumph. And the dome he created with his students, and among, among them he was Kenneth Nelson, um, this marked the starting point of his influential and successful, successful Humanitarian humanitarian design projects, ongoing research of he, his engineering, invention, architecture, architecture, poet, philosopher, and the forerunner, one should say, of a modern ecology. Um, this was the geoscope, so it went on until that. At that time, in summer 1948, John Cage and Merce Cunningham, both had been invited by Joseph Albers, met Bucky Fuller at the Black Mountain College. And the bulletin about their visit at the college is um, rewarding and appreciating their work, saying, and I quote from this bulletin, the current of creative energy, and the word energy is important in, at that time very much, the energy since their visit illuminated the college both in creation and in response. During that summer, Cage and Cunningham grew close to Fuller and who, who worked with them in music, dance and theater. Fuller even played in the performance The Rules of Meduse, the Medusa play, that was a part of John Cage's uh, one summer long um, concentration on Eric Satie. So he revived Eric Satie and the summer long he worked with the students on that and they had in this famous dining hall um, this play about the list, the rules of the Meduse and Merce Cunningham was very inspired by Fuller, by his ideas and how he spoke and demonstrated what we would call today his lecture performances. In summer 1952, they went on with these experimental theater and performance events, and Cage organized a situation, and perhaps should say it's a situation, that could be called, um, uh, in our um, uh, terms perhaps, and it was be called like the first happening. The already mentioned untitled event, sometimes later named theater piece number one, but I think there is no correct or, or fitting title for that. In the college dining hall where a number of performances took place within a choreographed time bracket, but without narrative or causal um, uh, correlation to each other. And I, there are lots of uh, documentations about that. I quote uh, Merce Cunningham because uh, his perspective is about this event quite interesting. So um, Cunningham writes, 
1952, Cage organized a theater event, the first of this kind. David Tudor played the piano, uh, MC Richards and Charles Olsen read poetry, Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings were at the ceiling, Rauschenberg himself played records, and Cage talked. The audience was seated in the middle of the playing area, facing each other, even today, a, a, a program or an audience setting which is kind of part of uh, experimental performances, facing each other, the chair, chairs arranged on diagonals and the spectators unable to see directly everything that was happening. So this kind of partial blindness uh, is uh, important. There was a dog which chased me around the space as I danced. Nothing was intended to be other than it was. A complexity of events that the spectators could deal with as each choose. So this is a kind of a just John Cage uh, homage to Bucky for their collaboration. And there is the Cunningham teaching these diagonals. And now I come to, I have now uh, three little points. The one is squares. Um, one of the spatial arrangements becoming an abstract pattern of movement and performance was the square. The form, the geometrical alignment of squares and square movements was part of the intersection of arts and the collaborative work of the artists at the Black Mountain College. Josef Alba's famous paintings, his studies in color, his squares are mirrored in graphics, in scores, and movement arrangements by Cunningham, Robert Rauschenberg, um, with his white uh, paintings, um, and Josef Albers again with his La Lok from 1944, a square with gravures like um, a score. Cage and Albers realized in 1948 that there were affinities between their interests in form and function of art and both the, for both the mind and the structure of delight in precision, in clarity and the observance of rules was very important. Both Rauschenberg and Albers worked on what they called the creative powers even of squares. Rauschenberg made for, for his solid black square, uh, made, made it from a wood block, so he worked with wood block at that time as well, like uh, Albers, and each subsequent page that he cut into a line, into the block's uh, surface, it was an inscription, a graph, which was similar as well to Albers' painting and woodcuts and to the scores of Cunningham and Cage. So the structures of space and time extensions, the, dyna the dynamics of still and movement, were the basic items of their artistic exploration. Robert Rauschenberg continued um, the black square, bringing the static um, wood block or wood cut into a movement in passing time. So with the words, it's kind of, or part of the title even, this is the first half of a print designed to exist in passing time. As you can read there. So, and John Cage picking up this line in their collaboration at Black Mountain mentioned that the pure form and reduction of Rauschenberg's white paintings would resemble, and I quote Cage now, mirrors in the air. They are like airports, another quote by Cage, like airports for shadow and dust. And there we even see that Marcel Duchamp, with whom they work together in the piece Walk Around Time, so Cage and Cunningham, uh, is in the background or is present with the Grand Verre, his big glass, the transparency on the one hand and the idea of working with dust. In 1952, the square, the same year where John Cage's famous piece 433 was performed, as well, Merce Cunningham made a drawing a score for his stand, Sweet by, by Change, which he called Space Chart Entrance and Exit, as well as Square, Transits, Traces, 
passages between entrances and exits were moving elements with these explorations of the kinetic and spatial dimensions of the square. Square dances, one could say, gave an impact <laughs> to Beckett's square as well. And of course, we have a line to Bruce Nauman and his square performances. Even Jasper Jones, who joined the Merce Cunningham Dance Company as an artistic director after Rauschenberg, so uh, in, uh, only in 1967 until 98, he continued this path of the square and it was in honor to the partnership of John Cage and Cunningham and Rauschenberg that Jasper Jones created his celebrated series titled Dancers on a Plane. So the, my next point is silence, stillness. Reflections of the relation of sound and space, of bodies and objects, and the echoes of the soundscapes of the mundane were part of the creative processes of artistic exploration, working, thinking, living together at Black Mountain College. John Cage and Richard Lippold um, talked about spaces and music and silences and what they call the silence of the sculpture. And Lippold created after that this work for five variations with a sphere for John Cage in 1947. And vice versa, Cage saw in Lippold's sculptures what he called the same endless possibilities of form as in the silent piece of 433. At this time at Black Mountain College, John Cage was experimenting with the question of form, what he called rhythmic structures, and uh, it was um, the question of percussive durational patterns, in which large parts were um, related to small parts in divisions of time. This was a way of working between music and dance that allowed them, Cage and Cunningham, to separate coming together only at structural points. The connection, duration, and shifting of micro and, and macro layers of the rhythmic information was organized and assigned by chance operations. For his piece, Music for Piano, 1952, Cage decided to take the imperfections in pieces of papers. So this is, um, I think, closely related to what um, Guy Lehmann said, because it, were, it was not the I Ching or other um, things, but it was the imperfections of the piece of paper uh, was the starting point as a basic, basic pattern uh, of chance operations. Thus, Merce Cunningham decided to do the same. Just have to see if I have. No, it's not yet here. To do the same procedure for his choreography. He, de he, de he designed as well imperfections of the paper to ascertain the space points for the dance. And he called the dance Sweet for Five in Space and Time. This is a, a, a new um, uh, uh, performance or a picture of a new performance. I quote him Using transparent papers as a grid, a bird's eye view of the playing space, I marked and numbered the imperfections, a page for each dancer in each dance. The piano part was played by David Tudor, who already or had played uh, and performed John Cage's silent piece. And uh, the music of Cage was variable to that piece in time. The titles of the dances, and it were four, five dances, Sweet for Five, and it were, were soli, duets, and even one quintet, were indicated abstract relations of time and space. And I think it's interesting that uh, titles like a random, or transition, or extended moment, or repetition, excursion, um, uh, um, uh, mark this suite. Uh, a very old title for a mu music piece, a suite, but in the middle of the suite was one solo entitled Stillness. In the dance, what does it mean to enact silence, and which is not, of course, the same than stillness, and on the contrary, what is the movement or the silence within the still and the silent? This is what they experimented or what, what the idea was. This, what, uh, this is what, as a paradox, is formulated with the quotation, um, there will never be silence, and of course, there will never be stillness. 
This calls in dance for a specific coordination of the moving body. And Caroline Brown, who was an important dancer at the Merce Cunningham Dance Company at that time, or for a long time, but in Black Mountain they started to work and founded the uh, Merce Cunningham Dance Company, she said or described it, this as a bodily enactment of synergy. So now the topic of synergy comes up again, or energy, and she, uh, she writes, Few dancers physically comprehended that deeper muscle knowledge of the body which understands the shadings of attack, what to make big and what to make small, without any single action losing its complete energy. And she uh, says that this was the important energy or synergy dimension in the Merce Cunningham work with the dancers. So my last part is now synergy. At the Black Mountain College where Cunningham and Buckminster Fuller both initially collaborated, questions of frequency and higher frequencies phases were part of their explorations. Merce Cunningham was the first choreographer to forge, to develop and exemplify synergetics in the dancing body, creating geokinematics or multi-lexical structural architectures. This repertory and movement concept was deeply connected with Buckminster Fuller's idea, his opus magnum synergetics. Um, I quote now, that a multiplicity of rhythmical structures can create interactive continuums that dance steps can synergize to raise the frequency of the dancing body and that a heightened body frequency can process several streams of digitation information and cognition. And this is Merce's invention, Merce Cunningham's. So Cunningham's search and choreographic assignment of axes of symmetry and asymmetry, pattern integrities and vector equilibriums showed close connections to Buckminster Fuller's geometrical and stereometrical search for a mathematical formula of what he called the closest packing of spheres, showing how spheres compact together symmetrically and tangentially. So Fuller's investigations since the late 1920s were trying to define architecture based upon temporal growth patterns rather than static spatial constructions. This led Fuller to what he called Jitterbug transformation. This is a variation of Fuller's discovery of what he called the tensegrity principle, so a basic thought of the structure and the inversion of tension and synergetics of foldings, of compression, what in German we say Zugspannung, and this is a work on inversions of, of inside-out or inside-outings uh, connected with the problem of, of um, space-time arrangement. And it's interesting, and not by chance, I would say, that Fuller named this tensegrity structure of tension and compression after the, at that time, very popular uh, swing dance known as Jitterbug. This be, uh, because the dynamics of the movement, the tension and compression in moving inside, outside, the very energetic dance mirrored perfectly the pro, uh, processual arrangement of the geodesic grids that uh, Fuller designed during the time of Black Mountain College. And I now try to, to get into the... No. It's just I wanted to show how the movement, this tension, the compression works. So it shows how pressure put onto 
two parallel triangles can create bouncing twist motion, one could say alternating the direction of the twist spin, and so each time it gets squeezed and it becomes another kind of the cubo-octahedric or tetrahedric um, uh, position. So it's about ro a rotation transition of crystal structures and the question of transformation in solids. I think the question of what is a solid, what is a, what is a static thing, and what are these transformations are the um, uh, 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 very important questions of tensegrity and what he called Jitterberg. As a flexible cubo-octahedron, which in specific manipulation instantiates rotational, symmetrical, and formations of other polyhedric, including in uh, octahedron and isocahedron. We look uh, up at how this is coming from the dance. You Having learned the basic steps, you now forget them completely. Uh, to be a head cat, you've got to practice plenty. You practice. Okay, just short, it's only short time, but you can, if you want to, there of course is a long and very, very much transformational part of that. So it is with it, this interdisciplinary field of dance and architecture, very interesting, that Rudolf von Laban, and I should go now to, can I go on? Yeah. Rudolf von, so these are, are the three uh, geodesic, um, uh, so these transformations, um, that Rudolf von Laban, uh, already in the 1914 and then in the 1920s as well, experimented with the isocaedron or isocaeda, and he designed it as a crystalline structure as well, as a model for his concept of what he called kinesphere, and as a basic spatial model for his development of a notational system, the kinetography or lava notation, which is very well known in the dance studies. So the idea of the Chitterbug transformation was, with this geometrical configura configuration, to maximize structural strengths and as well enable typical rigid material, material to be flexible. I quote Fuller in the end now, humans still think in terms of an entirely superficial game of static things, solids, surfaces, or straight lines, despite that no such things, no continuums, only discontinuous, energy, quanta, separate event packages operate as remotely from one another as the stars of the Milky Way. Science has found no things, only events. So this is how he, um, how he worked, and uh, I think these so solid, solids became phases in moving a form and in spatial arrangement. His Chitterberg transformations uh, made, um, as one could say, um, the platonic forms Dancing. The dancing Dimex Dimexian body was what, as well, Merce Cunningham um, tried to, um, to show. So, um, my last point, again coming back to what uh, Jai Lehmann said, uh, both Cunningham, Cage and Faller, um, they were creating new perspectives on working within these kinds of learning and um, producing art, uh, within these experimental envir environments where the importance of intuition, the play with imperfection or even failure of chance events, and um, as well the progress, including failure, as a step uh, of still moving were important. And uh, my last quote, uh, quote is Bucky Fuller in, you su succeed only when you stop failing, but the failing is in included. Thank you very much. Here for uh, for the for my remarks at the discussion. Um, it's an honor and of course a pleasure for me uh, to um, make some remarks uh, to uh, which uh, in which I will reflect some of the considerations Gabriele Brandstetter uh, made as well as my own interest uh, in Black Mountain College, which came up. Uh, Yaliman mentioned it uh, during my research about Cage's silent piece, uh, 4 minutes 33 seconds. We already heard about it. 
I think we all agree uh, that there is an actuality of the activities at Black Mountain College for the contemporary artistic practice and its reflection in the humanities. And of course, Black Mountain is a source, source of ideas for developing ideas how to change, or perhaps this is the European or even German perspective, preserve the idea of university, of academia in research and especially in not only academic education. But I'm also convinced that it will deepen our understanding of this very actuality when we are looking not only for analogies, but also for differences and contradictions. In this sense, I would like to propose a Black Mountain Epoch, a time and a space between 1933 and until 1965, with a specific context, conditions, and with a specific personnel distinguishable from the situation in the arts and at the universities today. Perhaps we could think of an untimely collaboration, I borrow this term from Jalai Tufuk, in a three-part constellation, I think it's a very strong and important term, Gabriel Wallstetter mentioned already, between uh, the Black Mountain Epoch, the 1960s, and the situation today. As a response to uh, Gabriel Wanschel's remarks on Cunningham, Cage, and Fuller, I would like to address three areas where the idea of an epoch, in my opinion, could be productive. Needless to say, I will only raise some questions here, possible topics for our further discussion. My first topic is a fundamental one. As we all know, the idea of crossing borders or blurring boundaries is a prominent feature in the theory and practice of the avant-garde until today. We have heard about such dualisms as sound and silence, stillness and motion, production and consumption, and um, we already heard about it, and it's, I think it's a, the most prominent one when we talk about uh, the avant-garde and Black Mountain, uh, the, uh, the relationship between art and life. My questions are, how can we explore such dualisms and their possible dissolution at Black Mountain College in a historiographic perspective? Is there a specific meaning of such terms as art and life during the Black Mountain Epoch? Can we explore the cause of the border between them? Can we describe how this border is set up, crossed or dissolved? My second topic is related to institutional issues. In our reflections, we often focus the artistic practices at Black Mountain, the documents, the comments of artists and critics. But we can also learn uh, from Black Mountain that the work of artists, its scope, as well as its outcome, is not independent from the surrounding conditions, from institutional, financial, political power. My questions in this area are, how can we describe the relationship of artistic practice and the institution in which it takes place within this epoch? <coughs> we, we know much about possibilities opened up, but what about the dynamics of friction, contradiction, opposition? And, of course, what conclusions can be drawn from it for today? Uh, the third area in this uh, third topic I would like to address more specifically the process of artistic production and how we deal with it. We hear a lot about collectivity, chance proce procedures, the strategy of non-hierarchy. Taking John Cage as a central figure and his silent piece as example, it would be interesting to discuss the relationship between these artistic dynamics and the concepts or the concept of authorship. On the one hand, we are talking about chance and collectivity. On the other hand, we admire a classical figure, a hero uh, of the avant-garde. Uh, by the way, of course, it's my hero. Uh, and his work, uh, his work of art, his uh, composition, for example, four minutes, 33 seconds. So my questions 
only in short, can we define what authorship means during the Black Mountain Epoch? Or should I better ask, can we describe how this term is used, adopted or transformed? I know these are very broad issues and of course uh, it's not Gabriele Brandstetter's mm -hmm. task to answer them, but um, perhaps you would like to make some remarks before uh, I open the um, discussion to the public. Yes, thank you for this very, very deep and crucial and of course um, um, big questions. So it's uh, are really questions for even more than a whole workshop day. Um, I, I, I think I take up one, uh, the question of authorship, the last one, um, because uh, of course we are tempted um, to focus on um, the big names and we are, we are interested in uh, how um, they came to Black Mountain College because they were guests. They, uh, so it's uh, uh, Yusuf uh, and Annie Alvas or others, they, they uh, were there for quite a long period. So we even should look at how are the, um, the faces of their um, dropping in, their staying, their teaching or working at summer school like Buckminster Fuller or um, Cage and Cunningham as well. These were quite short periods, but um, how, uh, so the question would be, how important is it uh, to think in long-term or durational uh, time frames uh, of the college and the collaboration? And on the other hand, uh, what is the, um, the kick-off um, effect and the dynamics uh, which um, those uh, artists or those persons created, even the, uh, the students, uh, who uh, were just for a quite short period there, but uh, had a, a kind of such a strong energy and, uh, and um, uh, um, renewed or um, developed and other dynamics and synergetics and collaborations, of course, at that um, place, so that it was an, an in and out, not only uh, within the college, but as well to other places. So it is a kind of, I would say, Black Mountain College is not only a place, uh, but it is a kind of uh, like um, the center of a resume or working like that in a Deleuzean term. And so the idea of authorship at, uh, uh, seen in, in that pers perspective is not very productive anymore. Mm -hmm. Even if we have the heroes, even if we are going back in a historiographic uh, mode where we write, uh, let's say, um, monographs or, bio, uh, or, uh, or works on one person like Cage or Cunningham or Falla, uh, coming, looking at Black Mountain, we have this kind of mm -hmm. dissolution of a, um, an idea of autonomy of work in any case. And so the authorship question as well is a kind of not very uh, uh, useful term. Mm -hmm. uh, this would be my, yeah. my answer. Thank you. So uh, with an eye of, uh, at the clock, uh, perhaps we should open the discussion now for questions. Uh, remark uh, because uh, when you were um, pointing to the um, scores of cage that were starting from the imperfections in the paper which uh, was something that Cunningham took up then uh, that's naturally related to Alba's practice that he uh, made the art the, the students work with paper very uh, intensely and also initially so this was one of I think even most famous practices that he would have them sit down, give them a pile of paper and uh, says, look what you can do with it. So maybe just mm -hmm. to add to your line what mm -hmm. the, the paper, the paper. Uh, was important. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, for the very interesting talk. Um, as I've been sitting here, actually, um, through your talk and also from Frau Lehmann, um, I found it interesting that the word uh, or the terminology uh, experiment, experimental, comes up because in many respects, um, uh, at least in my biography or my experience, um, this word uh, as a term, especially in the arts, um, went out of fashion. Uh, quite a few years ago, and uh, I, you know, I grew up in a time where we 
studied experimental film, uh, we went to experimental colleges, uh, we had experimental art programs, uh, we had experimental music, and at some point, um, even in, in certainly in the States, funding organizations actually gave the word that we're not funding experiments, we're uh, funding finished art pieces and uh, finished works. And of course, coming back to the um, uh, question which um, Frau Lehmann brought up about uh, product and certainly capitalism, we, um, at least those of us who are working and involved with artists in the art world um, know very well that we're in a period which is very product oriented. Um, uh, we may perhaps the, the terminology experiment has been replaced by um, process based art, um, artistic research now more recently, and uh, other ways to describe uh, works which is um, not product oriented. Um, but uh, you know, I think it's just interesting this, the way this terminology has changed and what that tells us about uh, another period. And of course, even the, the aspect of authorship um, feeds into this because um, experimental, not only in an individual sense, but in a social sense and yeah. group sense. Actually, I have a question. Um, I was really interested in the way that you talked about form. And I wondered what you felt about, it seemed to me to be like a tension between the idea of the square and the, the movement that's inherent in the jitterbug. I also wanted to know what the difference between a jitterbug and a boogie woogie is. Um, mm -hmm. I think about Andrea and the Broadway boogie woogie, they look similar, so I, I wondered if you knew what the difference was. And I, I wondered, uh, so, but I, I'm more, that's very technical. And one, like, how do you see that? How do you see the relationship between the kind of extremely bounded form of the square and like dynamism and, and movement? And there's a kind of, there's something underlying that, which is about the way that white culture recuperates African-American music and translates it. And you're in that space in North Carolina, which is still segregated. And but it's also the place that produces so much performative resistance to segregation at the end of the period that this college is in existence. I wondered if there's any sense, if you have any sense, if there, are there any connections that you see there between those kinds of threads that I was hearing in your presentation for which thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I think this is uh, not only one, but more questions you put up and very interesting questions. So the first, so the one about form. Um, this, I was really interested because um, this idea of the square is a kind of, uh, uh, really a, a very uh, very uh, strong and a very uh, clear and geometrical form which was dis dissolved and dissoluted uh, within this uh, uh, even uh, within the idea of there is something solid there is something uh, very clearly uh, aligned uh, which uh, gets blurred and which gets into a process even if it's a wood block or even it's a, a, a cutting, so the, the score in itself is not only, it's not uh, a score in the sense of a written thing anymore or a carved thing or, a, or whatever, but it's uh, the processuality which is part of all the experimental design there, it gets into that form or is part of the design of the form. Um, this was was uh, uh, why I constellated this kind of dances on a plane, one could say, or the dancing plane. Um, uh, 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 so, um, and the second question is even. Um, I'm not sure if it's connected, but in a way, yes, because uh, the whole um, uh, uh, long um, uh, pro progress in, in in research of. Bucky Fuller was really how to bring a solid thing uh, into a kind of um, uh, a torsion, a transformation, a movement, and to uh, to make it light uh, in in terms of material. And uh, this was connect. Uh, and uh, so um, the question: um, this is a question of form, material, and and structure, and time frames or time structures uh, as well. And I wanted to connect that because he really, with Jitterbug, related to the dance at that time. And um, of course, you, you are right. And there we are with the white and black square. Uh, so the, the question of white and black is, of course, a question of Jitterbug as well, because uh, it, it was a black dance. 
It, it used to be a black dance and it was then uh, a kind of uh, chic and, uh, and uh, get on the, in, into the club uh, of the, and was danced as a swing uh, as well with uh, uh, white people or also the pretty. Um, so the boogie boogie and uh, as well the, the rock and roll, they are all a kind of variations or later upcomings of uh, what the swing and the jitterbug was in the 30s and, and 40s. So as a, as a kind of dance form. And there are very virtuosic uh, um, uh, documentations about that, but the uh, important is the, um, the uh, what one would say, the basic form, which is this kind of coming to Zugspannung, uh, uh, this, what, what you could see. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to do this uh, little thing. I just wanted to add a little anecdote, which a fair, uh, which a friend of mine, Mr. Fuller, told when he came to his uh, uh, laboratory or his place where he worked. Um, so, but Mr. Fuller just discovered the, the, this uh, jitterbug uh, transformation, and he jumped on the table and did the few steps of the jitterbug, and then he said, "So I found it. It's, it's about this, really." So he himself uh, danced it and uh, just just this uh, anecdote. But I was really like uh, also thinking of um, this uh, relationship of the square and the triangle from which he developed then the transparency thing. And this, this notion of the, the whether really what you mentioned, the time came in in this, this process of um, really um, getting the movement into a transformation of spatial arrangement. And where he also quote, I just quote from, from my memory, it's, it's like something where he says we have a, um, in this way, space is meaningless. We have relationships, but no space. So um, nothing in the universe touches anything. We have these relationships, but no space, which I think uh, relates very much to this, uh, that it's only about the movements and about the changing uh, um, solutions in these uh, transformations of form. And uh, um, just two other little things. Uh, I was very grateful for this uh, uh, moment of, of stillness uh, because I had to think of something else in dance history. Then Steve Paxson, who years later was uh, developing his notions about uh, stillness and dance, and that there is no stillness about the little of, um, imperceptible movements in dance. Um, he was trained long time as a kind yeah. dancer, and so. Um, yeah. I wonder if this comes not very much out of this experience. I would as well. say yes. <laughs> and uh, the last thing then was uh, is this really a question? Um, I wondered uh, when you were talking about synergy, also how would you relate it to this uh, very close term of uh, synesthesia? So um, going back to what you mentioned also, um, Diori, um, um, his thoughts on uh, um, aesthetic experience and uh, also to go back perhaps to, to um, the other um, early arts movement and this uh, thinking about uh, this in between the arts. Um, um, so this question, are the arts just um, um, put next to each other or are there real kinds of uh, intermedial connections and uh, which also where this uh, notion of synesthesia comes into, into question on, on very strong basis. Just thinking of that. Thank you very much for that. In looking uh, at the uh, uh, time, <laughs> so I, I, I just uh, two short uh, um, points. Yes, I, of course I did not mention it, but I thought of uh, um, uh, Steve Paxton and his small dance, and I, uh, since he was cl they were close with Miss Cunningham, I'm sure that there is one of these uh, outlines and impacts of the Black Mountain College um, going into the church and church experiments and tasks and all that. And um, the second, uh, even the synesthesia, I think one should read, reread Dewey again and uh, as well uh, go to the Bauhaus back because um, even I think at the Bauhaus there was not only the synesthesia in a sense, in a sense of there is a um, um, Connected uh, uh, a connection of aesthetics and senses uh, uh, on the one hand, um, but as well that with the synesthesia and synergy, there comes much more the question of materiality in, and media into the quest in, in, into the whole process. And so synesthesia connected more to the uh, mode of perception. 
um, I would say, and uh, synergy even more a question of how to do it. So the question of how to do it and how to work with different uh, kinds of materials and arts and crafts is a part of Black Mountain and Bauhaus, of course, as well. And so I would uh, just take that together. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you for your speech and thank you for the, for the discussion. I think there are several topics and questions which will come up later with the other speakers. So uh, I think we should go on with our schedule. Thank you.